the best response you can have to a payoff in a thriller is someone goes, oh, right, I forgot, of course, I should have thought that. On Story offers a look inside the creative process from today's leading writers, creators, and filmmakers. All of our content is recorded live at Austin Film Festival and at our year-round events. To view previous episodes, visit OnStory.tv. OnStory is brought to you in part by the Alice Kleberg Reynolds Foundation, a Texas family providing innovative funding since 1979. From Austin Film Festival, this is On Story, a look inside the creative process from today's leading writers, creators, and filmmakers. This week's On Story, the writer behind Disney's beloved animated Beauty and the Beast, Linda Wolverton. And I really grew up in a, in a time that we, we were, we were going to change the world. And I still have it. So when they brought me in to write Beauty, I thought, oh, now here's my opportunity to change the perception of the Disney victim heroine. In this episode, Linda Wolverton discusses writing some of Disney's most beloved films, Beauty and the Beast, The Lion King, and Maleficent. You know, I came up in the in the 70s, and I was, you know, really, I wasn't a hippie, but I was looking up toward at the hippies, and I really grew up in a, in a time that we... We were, we were going to change the world, and I still have it. So when I walked into Disney, and I had written um, a, a, a script, they hired me to write a Winnie the Pooh feature that they didn't make, but it suddenly it became like the entree into writing Beauty. So when they brought me in to write Beauty, I thought, oh, now here's my opportunity to change the perception of the Disney victim heroine which had always bugged me um, because I, you know, not, there's nothing wrong with all the Disney heroines that came before, princesses, because they were, they were products of their time. But times had changed and I really didn't think that, that women and girls were gonna buy it, that she was gonna be a victim like the, like the fairy tale, you know, has it. So um, I was subversive. I didn't tell them my agenda. I have never told them my agenda. And I always had the agenda. And they never got it. They never got until it was Alice. Because, she, because Alice made a billion dollars. It was like, oh, girls can make money. So with, with Belle, you know, she had to be an intellectual. She had to not be about her beauty. You know, she had to be the, the proactive one who went out to, she exchanged herself for her father, which is upside down and backwards because he's the old person, she's the young person, but she was gonna save his life. She could see past uh, uh, surfaces to what, what lies within. She could see that he was something more than what he appeared to be. She could see Gaston was something more than what he appeared to be. So it was a battle, it was a battle because we were really pushing an, an old school vision. It was an old boys club at Disney then. And I, I really didn't have any support group. So I was really on my own. And um, I had never written animation before. I'd never written a screenplay really before. But I really believed in this. And I really understood the importance and the responsibility of it. And then when Howard Ashman came along, um, we sort of partnered up, and then we were co-conspirators, and and that was great. Um, but yeah, it was it was it was very very difficult to change a culture. The animation process 
isn't, uh, and to this day, is, is very much, a, it's, it's sort of a push-pull between the, the writer and the story department. Um, because they, they actually have to board, you know, the words from the page. So take it from one medium to another medium. And in the past, in all of the history of Disney, you know, the, the story department really created the, the story. And it wasn't really until Beauty um, that, you know, Jeffrey Katzenberg came in and sort of started running animation at the time. And he brought in the, the live action model, which was, we'll have a screen play first, and then we'll go from there. Which there was so much pushback. Not to him, because he was the boss, but to me. And how did you deal with those challenges, both with kind of this new approach to writing a Disney film, but also as being a woman? Uh, uh, <laughs> it was not easy. You know, I had Jeffrey Kansberg support, but, you know, I'm a strong-willed person, and I would just take them on. And, and I remember, and in not a great way, you know, I remember I threw the script at the director one day and left, and then another time I said, and I called him out, and I said, is, he would never look me in the eye. This is, there was two directors. One of them would never look at me. And I finally said, is this a woman thing? You know, what is it? He didn't admit it, but he started looking me in the eye after that. <laughs> so I just flat out called him out, you know? I, I just, uh, I, it was too important not to. I want to dissect the story of beauty a little bit more. And you, in particular to your approach to the fairy tale adaptation, because the one that I found and read, the father actually offers Belle up as payment yes. for stealing the rose, yes. um, which I didn't know until yes. researching this. Um, just, but also along with the role of the hero and the villain in the film, because as screenwriters, you know, we're taught that your hero has to change. Um, but to me, Belle was pretty set in her ways, and it was really the beast who changed. Yes. And the beast is not the villain, it's Gaston. Yes. And so I just, I'd love to hear about your unique approach to these characters um, and how you approach the story differently from the fairy tale. Well, the, the you know, the fairy tale couldn't work in, in today. And they had tried it. It was actually, you know, some people had, there's a, some boards of it and it, it, it didn't work and it wasn't gonna happen that way. Um, you, you know, uh, the father couldn't offer her up. Uh, he, he was, uh, we, Howard and I came up with him being an inventor because it was an interesting thing to do. We had to get rid of him to, so he could cap the castle. Um, and, uh, you know, every, every, like the objects in the castle being alive, a, a little bit of a Cocteau, you know, nod. Um, but I hadn't seen the Cocteau movie in a really long time. And then basically when Howard, it, I wrote it as a non-musical first, and then it, after The Little Mermaid, it became a musical. So, um, and I had had all the objects that didn't talk. They were silent, you know, running around. And he said, well, who's gonna sing my songs? <laughs> like, oh, I guess I have to talk. <clears throat> so then they became an entire household uh, of castle worth of, of objects. So that was just, you know, the beginning is the approach of how to make it into a musical. And then with regard to Belle changing, it's a really interesting idea. You know, does Belle change? Um, yes, she does change. It's not, you know, the obvious absolute full circle change that you see, but I, in many, many, most, most movies now, I don't think there's only one way to make a movie, and I don't think there's only one way to approach a protagonist. So I, I go up, up against that a lot because, you know, Belle is clearly not, you know, she wasn't a silly girl who turned into Belle, the smart girl, you know. She didn't want Gaston. She had a, a, a view about what she did want, but she, uh, but she also had to let go of the past. She had to embrace this environment, and in the embracing of the environment, she changed the environment, and she changed herself. I did come from the theater. I have a master's in theater for children, which really, again, things that, that help you. I didn't go to a fancy school. I went to Cal State Long Beach um, and, I, and Cal State Fullerton. And I actually, they had a master's program in theater for children, 
which enabled me to be around a child audience. And we, I studied something called participation theater. In participation theater, um, you actually um, leave holes in the play itself for the audience to tell you how it goes. And so you ha it has to be controlled, otherwise it'll go insane. You have to have these controls in, built in. The whole thing is like, it, it's very, very structured, but it looks unstructured. And, but there are these moments where you actually have to open it up to your audience, which means that as a performer, I was a performer, you have to listen. You have to, and I, and I would think of it as like taking the energy, their energy came through me, and I fed it back. So it was a really uh, an energy exchange. Um, and it was, it was a remarkable, re remarkable growth and uh, learning experience for me because I can, to this day, feel the child audience and know that I have to get out of the scene because they're going to be throwing things or you know, running around. or I can still feel the timing from, from that. Did you approach your scripts for Maleficent and Alice differently than your animated scripts? Um, and if so, what did you find those big differences as a writer to be? I don't approach them differently at all. I know the process will be really different, but I do not, I don't write it differently. The script doesn't look any different. It's the same format of, you know, um, any format they use for a screenplay. Um, so, is the writing different? No, it's all about your audience, and it's the same audience. So really, there is it, there's nothing. Um, Alice was an interesting experience because my agent had had a meeting with uh, these producers, and and Disney was looking for a large tentpole four quadrant movies at the time, and no, um, <laughs> they said this was you know the early days of that, and my and my agent asked. Oh, the producer asked my agent if I had an idea for Alice in Wonderland. And uh, he said, yeah, I think she does. He called me and said, do you have an idea for Alice in Wonderland? <laughs> he said, no, I don't. <laughs> he said, can you get an idea for Alice in Wonderland? <laughs> okay, set the meeting, and I'll have figured it out by then. <clears throat> so Alice was, hmm, what would I do? In the, and for me... Very often, and you've heard this before from so many writers, it really is what if. It's really the question of what if. What if, and we wanted, I knew that we wanted to have an, a more adult a protagonist. What if she was older and she goes back? Because they're in trouble. So that just opened that whole thing up. And then, so I wrote that and, and then, um, Tim Burton read the first draft and came on. So that was an incredible experience as well. I'm so lucky, <laughs> right? Wow, so lucky. See, the first word I thought of for a project like that was intimidating. Just kind of approaching oh, yeah. a Lewis Carroll. I know, right? I mean, what was that like using that source material? That's and such a great that? question because it was, it was, I had don't get writer's block. Mm. And when I really thought about it, because Alice in Wonderland is one of like, right, second to the Bible or something, you know, and how many people have read it and love it, and he's, he was, you know, Lewis Carroll. Um, and so I really did have writer's block. I don't know what to write. And I had like, I had promised him the script. This was Christmas, and I had promised him January. <laughs> I was not anywhere. Um, and I pitched it. You know, and I went to. I took my daughter to London for the Christmas holiday, and something about being there. And I was walking through Hyde Park, and really like this is too intimate. I'm frozen. I'm frozen with fear, and I I ran into a bust of Lewis Carroll, and I actually asked his permission. And so talk about that source material. How much did you dive in and and utilize? I mean, clearly a lot. Um, but what was what was that like? You know, working with this reimagination of Alice, with this just great resource available to you. The the resource doesn't automatically um, jump off the page as a movie because it's it's really episodic, 
and it and she doesn't change. Um, and it's just episodic, and it's, it was very political. It was very much about the politics at the time. So everything is symbolic about the politics of Britain at the time. So a lot of that, I you know, isn't going to apply. Um, and so, uh, of course, I had to bring my feminist thing to it. Um, but I was looking at it, I was like, what am I going to do here? And I was looking at this, this one, um, the tenniel illustrations from the original, in the Jabberwocky, and the boy is, is, has his back, to, is looking up at the Jabberwocky, and his back is to us, and he has long hair. And I thought, why, do, why does he have to be a boy? <laughs> and why can't that be Alice? You know, why isn't the Jabberwocky the symbol of everything that she has to, that she has to overcome in herself to move on? So I changed it. Mm -hmm. I, I, brought it, I brought it in. And again, because I felt OK to do that, because she, we were doing a different telling. She's an adult. If I, if I had made it her a child and tried to just like replicate you know, Lewis Carroll's work, I wouldn't have felt OK about it. But I did, because we were, just, we were doing this version. I'd love to hear just kind of how um, your relationship to theme work impacts the story. And especially with this, you brought up the Victorian society as a backdrop of being, you know, the central kind of character and almost antagonist, if you will. Um, you know, how did that mm -hmm. kind of all shape the world for Alice for you? I did a lot of research on Victorian moors, mm -hmm. you know, and how women are, what you're allowed to do. And, you know, uh, women are thrown into the insane asylum if they ask questions, <laughs> or if they stand up to their husband, or um, so uh, I just felt this, you know she was gonna. This is a character who's who's curious and, and interested, and she's gonna push push against all of those structures as hard as she can. Um, and so that was a large part of of how to frame the above of the world thing. And also then in in Underland. And I named it Underland because, again, it helped differentiate. And the rationale was when she was a little girl, she thought they said Wonderland, but they said Underland. Hmm. So that would differentiate. So I'm really not trying to be Lewis Carroll. Um, so yes, Victorian, the whole Victorian, uh, the, the Victorian world was, a, was an antagonist t toward Alice. Um, and so thematically, theme drives everything for me. I want to talk really quickly about the Red Queen, just because she's one of my favorite characters in the movie. Um, yeah. And just you know how you extracted that persona from the Lewis Carroll works. Um, maybe even talk about some of your favorite scenes with her in creating those. Um, the, the Red Queen is really an amalgam of the White Queen and the Red Queen from the books. And really, the, the inspiration for her was the tenniel illustrations again. You know, if you look at the tenniel illustrations, her mouth is open, it's half of her head is open. I mean, it's a giant, like, angle, what her mouth is. And she's just screaming all the time. Um, and it's off with her head. Um, so that's really where she came from. And the whole idea of the off with her head. I thought, now Disney's never going to do this. Um, where would those heads go? In the bloody moat. They came to me and said, we're thinking about a movie about Maleficent. Do you want to take a stab at it? Um, I don't know. Didn't she have, curse a baby to die? <laughs> how, how do you make a protagonist out of that? So I watched it, and I thought she was a witch. Well, turns out she's not a witch. She's a fairy. Huh. I know. So. I'm looking at it, and she's a fairy. And then all the little cute little fairies are flying around, and they have wings. Where are her wings if she's a fairy? I thought, ah, what happened to her wings? 
And whatever happened to her wings would justify, it was so bad, it had to justify the fact that she would curse a baby. He did this to me so he would be king. Can you talk real quickly about this idea of world building? Well, with Maleficent, I'd always wanted to do Dark Fairy, the world of Dark Fairy. Um, so it was, oh, here's my chance. Um, and then I just delve into the world and, and research the characters and what they do and what their powers are and, you know, all those m many, many things. And with Maleficent, the world was much more complex than the, than the world that you see in the movie. It had much more of a political hierarchy, and Stefan was not a human. He was a halfling. Yeah, he was a halfling, and he was treated like <laughs> um, for being a halfling, and so he had a grudge against fairies, which is, a, to me, a better motivation. Um, it had to evolve. Um, so world building is, is just uh, where your imagination gets to just go wherever it wants to go based on, on the, the research of, of the environment. You know, and of course, the rules. You always have to go by the rules, and you have to create them early on, which is my mistake. I don't. And then later on, I'm like, well, what? And they're like, what are the rules? What are Maleficent's powers? Oh, she has magic. <laughs> well, what can she do? What are the limits of her magic? Oh, you mean like, don't get her wet? No. <laughs> no, she's magic. You know, she, she can, well, why, can't, why doesn't she just change them all into frogs? Well, maybe she could change them all into frogs, but that's what the story is. You know, so you really do have to come up with the rules early on. So you can answer those questions later. You said earlier there's not one way to approach a protagonist. And I think with Maleficent that is so true and it comes through so powerfully because she's the villain, but I'm rooting for her in this movie. And so talk to us about the development of this character um, and just kind of how you had this this dual hero villain, um, but also kind of sourced from the original Sleeping Beauty story. Well, we, we did have, we were held to the, the Disney original. We had to really f follow that, which was problematic because seven years pass, or, you know, things you're sort of stuck with it isn't great storytelling, but you're kind of stuck with it. Um, the hero villain, I did it with the Beast. You know, so, um, well, that was the huge challenge at all of, of Maleficent. How do you make a, a villain in one movie, the hero in another? And how? Well, because you follow them. You are them. You suffer what they suffer. You go through, the, you understand them from their soul, and then you can understand why, why would they would do something that ultimately, which makes them the protagonist, because you are them, ergo the protagonist, and so that you, 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 you they're, behavior is justified. Um, to me, she was always the protagonist. She was never the villain. Because we're looking at it from her point of view. It's always the switch of point of view as well. Um, it, was, it was a huge challenge. Bruno Bettelheim wrote a book called The Uses of Enchantment. And I, use, I used to, I, I, I really rely on, the, on the, someone like him who really says that this is about teaching um, teaching young children or children how to live. And living isn't always easy. And there is death. And there's people who will kidnap you in, in life. And if you couch it in a fairy tale story, you actually give them an opportunity to see how someone faces a challenge and survives it. But these are real things that are really going to happen. Parents will die. Your parents will die. Parents will get divorced. These are, I mean, what are we protecting them from? What are we pretending about? Let's not. Let's face these things. Let's take it on and show how somebody 
overcomes it, faces it, overcomes it, learns something, grows, post-traumatic growth, and therefore they're more, you know, they're, they're ready or they're more prepared when these things happen to them. Or if it's actually happening, they have like, oh, look at that person. If they can do it, I can do it. So I think that's a, a, a moral and psychological education. You've been watching A Conversation with Linda Wolverton on On Story. On Story is part of a growing number of programs in Austin Film Festival's On Story Project, including the On Story PBS series, now streaming online, the On Story radio program, the On Story podcast, and the On Story book series, available where books are sold. To find out more about On Story and Austin Film Festival, visit onstory.tv or austinfilmfestival.com. 